I'm Gary Harlan, author of Always Faithful and executive producer of A Vietnam Peace Story. And I'm Andy Klein, director of A Vietnam Peace Story. And this video is about the writing of the book and the making of the film. Well, the first thing I'd say about war is that there's no romance, you know. They make movies about how romantic war is, you know, and things. It's not, it's ugly. When we were growing up, it was kind of assumed that we would somehow go off to war. Each generation had had a war. And when Vietnam came along, we just thought it was our turn. It became clear to me uh, early on that it was about survival and about survival for me, my friends. And uh, I don't think it made much of a difference if we were there or if the North Vietnamese were there or if the VC owned the country. The peasants would have been doing the same thing, trying to live, work their rice fields and and live the way that they've lived for thousands of years. I'd be remiss not to mention a man whom I'm proud to call a friend, Mr. Fred Smith, founder and CEO of FedEx, whose generous support made our journey possible. One thing I can say about Fred is, he is the real deal. A Marine officer in Vietnam who was wounded twice, awarded the Silver Star, Bronze Star. Fred's generosity is not limited to veterans. FedEx has built six schools in Vietnam. When Gary asked me to uh, film this trip to Vietnam uh, with seven former Marines, I put together my best crew from Carbon Trace Productions, and we set out to... Uh, capture what I thought was going to be a terrific story. The idea that for these men, Vietnam could stop being so much a war and start being a place and a people. A very long journey indeed. I put the word out that I intended to organize a trip to Vietnam. Some guys chose to go back out of curiosity. Some like Bob Deddy in a specific, for a specific reason, in his words, to get back a piece of himself that was lost. Gene Cleaver, who was shot in the chest in the first minutes of a fierce battle on Hill 50, wanted to return to the site of that battle and learn what the hell happened before and after he lost consciousness. We interviewed the seven men uh, before making the trip, and they all had interesting stories to tell, uh, especially about why they joined the Marines and what it was like to become a Marine. We were aboard the USS Paul Revere. We awoke at 0300 ate a hearty breakfast, and at dawn we climbed down the ropes to the landing craft and headed to the shoreline, having no idea if we'd be soon be in a battle. I prayed, God, don't let me die today. If I got killed later on, so be it. I just wanted to discover what kind of place this was and what kind of man I was. Our first 30 days in country were brutal. Casualties were light, but it was exhausting, the most exhausting experience of my life. We covered 500 square miles on foot in those 30 days. It was raising a good, it was raining a good part of the time, so it was not only physically brutal, but also miserable. We'd walk all day and then dig foxholes at night. 
we didn't always stay in those foxholes. A lot of the time we were sent out on night patrols or setting up a night ambush that seldom produced results, other than returning to the perimeter the next morning with a bunch of leeches attached to our bodies. One was attached to my testicles. During the pre-trip interview, Bob Deddy spoke the most important line of the movie because it spoke to the theme that we were trying to capture. I lost part of me there. And I want it back. Before our trip, we donated a water purification system to the Mac Dinh Chi School in Quang Nai Province, one of the poorest provinces in Vietnam. The school was built by former Marine officers in 2006. Our visit and the installation of the water system was arranged by Heap Nguyen of East Meets West in Da Nang. Heap indicated that there would be a simple dedication ceremony. Instead, we were treated to an entertainment program. I hadn't expected to get emotional during the trip, but the deal is we fought in Quang Nai and we encountered poor hungry children on a daily basis. And here we were two generations later being entertained by happy, healthy Quang Nai children. So act one of the film was the introduction of the man who made the trip. Act two was really about their encountering Vietnam and Vietnamese culture um, since the war uh, to try to capture some of the differences between what they experienced before and something very, very new and different and quite wonderful. It's hard to say what's going on inside somebody. I mean, they don't, if they don't uh, you know, reveal it explicitly, outwardly. And, uh, but uh, I, I know I know something is going on. I know that, that you know that it's quite a profound experience for him. Some people have said that, uh, that they'll never see it the same way again. The the, the, me the memory, the, me the set of memories that they had from the war are just been kind of evaporated. That uh, they're just the past literally is dead. I never drank. I never never did drugs. I never turned to that and never beat my wife and my kids and things. But, uh, you know, a lot of times I'd go out behind the barn, you know, behind the barn, so to speak, and, and cry, you know. And I never knew for years and years why I did this and uh, until I actually got some help. I don't think this will ever happen to me again. You know, things kick it off. Smells, uh, sounds, rotor blades, helicopter rotor blades, things like that. They kick every vet off, you know. For, but I don't, I don't think I'll ever have this problem again. And I, so Vietnam has been amazing for me to, as a, to heal myself, to heal myself. After my first return trip to Vietnam in 1994, I was interested in organizing an event in 96, marking the 30th anniversary of Operation Utah. I proposed to call it a reunion of former enemies, the North Vietnamese Army and the U.S. Marines. 
It took 25 years, but I finally got to meet NVA soldiers who fought on Operation Utah, or what they called the Western Sun Tin Campaign. The reunion of former enemies was a success. Ninety-eight Marines were killed on Operation Utah and 278 wounded. Our company, Lima Company, suffered 10 killed and 20 wounded fighting on Hill 50. I was impressed at how Doc Ryerson could recall the exact location of the action that took place 53 years earlier. You know, then, then if this is the hole, it would have been three times as deep. Um, and this, this, this fits a lot better. There's almost like a, a little shelf down there, here, um, up in this direction. The first wounded that I treated would have been right here, who was beyond help. There was another one, <clears throat> 10 or 20 feet above him, who had been taking a bullet through the belly. And that's when, when Fitch came up and with his radio whip antenna signaled if, if the if the VC was down there, that whip antenna was going like this. And you know, they always wanted to take out the radio men if they, if they could. And, and they, got, they got him right in the leg. And he and I were bent over keeping low. And I saw his, uni his, his pants leg blouse open. And then something pitched me forward over the, the wounded guy. Um, we untangled ourselves. And then Gary Harlan and Hester saw me struggling down here and came to, to help. And they got those two guys out. And we got up to the top. We could see the Arvin troops were over there 50 or 60 feet. And I thought, well, we're safe here. So I, I just cut open Dave's trouser leg to look at his, the wound from, from the grenade. And um, he was laying on his back. I was on my belly. And I had just looked at his wound and he started to scream, VC, VC. Um, the fellow in the spider hole had, I think, followed us up the hill through the brush and uh, was gonna do us in. And as Dave screamed VC, uh, he started to fire with his AK-47. And I thought, well, this is how it's gonna end. So um, I, as quick as I could, I rolled to my left and I pulled my 45 from my shoulder holster. And as I came up with my 45, there was a burst from a feminine 14. And one of our squad leaders saw the corpsman working on a, on a, on a wounded guy and came over to kind of give him cover and he, he neutralized the, 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 the North Vietnamese at. And it was just this bang, bang, bang action. I don't think I had time to get scared, but when I heard the AK-47, I thought, we're not gonna make it. And um, so when, when, when there was a burst from the AK-47, a burst from the M-14, and then I, I finally got turned over, I looked, and uh, Dave had gotten shot in the foot again, and the, uh, the dead North Vietnamese soldier was kind of laying at her feet. Um, and um, that's, that's kind of how 
Operation Utah ended for me. You know, after that, things quieted down and we picked up our, our wounded and the dead Marines and things and, and uh, moved away after that. But for three hours, it was, you can't describe it. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, as we gather together on the top of this infamous mountain that has uh, haunted us and our previous enemies that are friends today, we're, we're so grateful to come here and have closure and to reflect back on uh, those, those terrible times. And One morning in May of 1968, my outfit, India Company, 3rd Battalion, 27th Marines, was preparing to embark on an operation when the, when the company clerk ran up and informed me that I had orders for stateside. That operation was codenamed Allenbrook. 172 Marines were killed on Operation Allenbrook and 1,124 were wounded. In one day alone, India Company suffered 20 deaths and about three times that many wounded when they were caught in an ambush on this dry riverbed. The North Vietnamese Army was heavily entrenched all along the densely wooded tree line you see on the bank. The casualties would have been even higher had it not been for Private First Class Robert C. Burke, a machine gunner with the company, who launched a one-man assault against the enemy emplacements. Providing cover fire, he permitted other members of India Company to come up and remove the wounded from exposed positions. He continued to advance upon the enemy and to suppress enemy fire until he was killed. PFC Burke was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. He was 18 years old, the youngest Medal of Honor recipient in the Vietnam War. I felt the need to see the spot where my best friend, Nate Lee, died. As I mentioned in the second part of this story, Nate was like the older brother I never had. Getting my promotion to sergeant and moving into the sergeant quarters back at Camp Pendleton and forming a friendship with Nate inspired hope for the future. With his death, my life became darkened by survivor's guilt. Something I've, I've wanted to do for, for 25 years, to see this spot right here where, where my good friend and uh, a lot of my squad got killed. Emotionally, I'm in the right place to be here today. Feel balanced today, centered. Over there, a couple of clicks. Um, it's where Alexander was killed. Yes. He was. He was. Uh, we were we were in the same fire team and, uh, for six months. I mean that was like brothers. A black marine, <laughs> a black hillbilly brother. marine, and a white hillbilly marine. No color. He was a marine brother. And I I remember back then the black folks that they, they cut parts in their hair. You know you shaved it. So a white boy I I cut a part in his hair, but it was about that wide, and that was. I mean, that was fucked up, you know? And all I remember is walking, walking by a tree in this black jacket and ace bandage and a bunch of fucking blood. Okay, we don't have to. Just talk about sin, make it happen. You want to? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. That, that was February 21st when, when that happened, and, and when this happened in here was October. So, so that's about it. It, it does. Well, it, uh, that's not, one of the reasons. <laughs> that's the big reason I came back. It, it's hard, even after 53 years. It's tough. Maybe some people don't understand how how you can hold that in for so many years, but it's there. I think this helped. All right, I'm dry. <laughs> my biggest takeaway is that my war is here, not here. I think I'm more at peace, you know, and I noticed that I, I don't, I really don't have any animosity with, with the Vietnamese 50 years ago, 40 years ago, probably, but I'm a different person. 
now, you know, I've, I've grown, I've learned a lot. I don't know if I found a piece, that exact piece of me, but I'm closer. You know, I think I can, I can be at peace with it. I'm at peace with the country and the people here. Just, I'm taking it as it comes in the moment. And so I'm not thinking about 50 years ago, you know. Before, I thought about it every day for years. And that's kind of subsided. Our journey ended, oddly enough, at a place called Cowboy Jack's Saloon and Restaurant in Hanoi. If, you've, if you're interested in watching a Vietnam peace story in its entirety, click on the link below. I also encourage you to read my book, Always Faithful, Returning to Vietnam. Finally, regarding Bob Deddy's life being impacted by the death of Charlie Alexander, he was not alone. Alex was loved by everyone who knew him.